Um, tonight, I'm joined by uh, Professor Eddie Glaude, Jr. He is, uh, he's been on the show before. Uh, we spoke at great length about his book, Democracy in Black. Uh, but tonight, we're talking a little bit more in depth about the election 2016. We'll be talking about uh, his debate on democracy now with Michael Eric Dyson. Uh, and then I want to ask him, we'll talk a little bit about the lesser of two evilism uh, between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. But before we go into all of that, I want to welcome him to the show, Professor Glaude. Um, how are you today? And thank you so much for joining us. I'm doing well. It's a pleasure to be with you, Doc. It's, it, thank you. It's a pleasure having you here. Um, my, my audience is uh, excited about the conversation. They've been talking about this interview, uh, this debate, and it was a friendly debate. I, first of all, mm -hmm. the conversation that you had with Mike Eric Dyson last week in Philly, um, I'm upset because I was in Philly and I didn't get a chance to see or meet either one of you in person, but I'm really ecstatic because it was such a robust conversation in such a short period of time. And you guys covered some very important important topics. Um, and, and I think that you ran into some of the um, conundrums is the only word I could think of that I'm personally running into. Um, so one, thank you for that conversation. But then two, thank you for coming here to talk about it a little more. Um, and we can just jump right into it. I want to play a small clip of the conversation that you had with um, Michael Eric Dyson. And we'll use that as a primer uh, for this conversation. Okay. Or democracy. What I'm concerned about, Mike, is what you know as well as I do, mm -hmm. is that political scientists have said that black folk are a captured electorate. That is to say, the Republican Party doesn't have to care about what we do, and the Democratic Party, every four, two, four, six years, come into our communities I'm with you on and that. try to herd us to the polls like we're cattle chewing cows. I'm with you on and that. And then they have no obligation, no obligation to deliver on policy. But so, so she shows up, she shows up in, hold up, hold up, she okay. shows up in a church. Right. They come to churches. Right. They come into our communities. And when mm -hmm. we talk about policy, how are you addressing the, leg the legacy of But I'm doing, with you on that. So, so point of, point of, point of, so then, but if you're with me on that. Right. How is it then that a Democratic Democratic candidate can come into our community, come into this moment where all of this suffering, where you and I have laid it out mm -hmm. in both of our books, all this suffering is engulfing our communities. When we look at the back of Barack Obama's head, what's mm -hmm. going to be behind it are the ruins mm -hmm. of black communities, the ruins of the most vulnerable I in this agree. country. And then we get business as usual, rebranded. And only because we are afraid of Donald Trump and not understanding our power Let you know what, as but, the demo. But, but, all right. So... That was we, we we picked it up in the middle of the conversation, and you were you were bringing some serious truth and a rhetorical heat as well as just philosophical truth. Um, I, I want to ask you in general about the the premise that you guys were arguing about uh, this this tension between facing a person like Donald Trump and facing a political party, the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, that has done a disservice to the black community. Where is that threshold for you? How do you, wh where do you fall in that tension? Well, you know, as I argued in, in, the, in the conversation with Mike, uh, is that we, we need to do two things simultaneously. We have to keep Donald Trump out of the White House and we have to announce that business as usual is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's hard to do. Uh, the fears around Donald Trump are genuine, and they make sense to me. Um, but we can't vote from a place of fear. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of what I think we have to do uh, is we have to uh, uh, keep, obviously keep Donald Trump out of the White House, but we also have to continue the necessary work of, of, of undermining the neoliberal wing of the Democratic Party, Mm -hmm. undermining the economic philosophy of neoliberalism uh, that has in so many ways eviscerated the working class in this country, mm -hmm. has deepened the misery of the most vulnerable and the most marginal, which disproportionately impact black and brown communities. And what I find strange, actually, what, what I find uh, almost deeply hypocritical is a refusal to understand how Hillary Clinton has played a central role, right, in the corporate takeover of the Democratic Party, uh, how her policies uh, have, economic philosophy in particular, mm -hmm. how her economic, pol economic philosophy has in so many ways harmed and devastated our communities. And so I'm, I'm really uh, skeptical of all of these black surrogates who think that she's somehow a savior. Mm. Um, 
And so I kept pushing Mike back. And so what I heard by the end of the conversation is that Hillary Clinton is a stopgap measure for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, He doesn't want Donald Trump in office. And I believe that we can't vote from a position of fear, that we have to vote from a position of power. So, yeah. Okay, so two questions come immediately out of that. One is, well, one is a question and one is an observation. I agree um, uh, with with everything that you said about Hillary Clinton. In fact, I talk about it ad nauseum on this show. I, I think I'm tired of even hearing myself talk <laughs> about it, to be honest with you. Um, you. But but tell me, let's start here. I'm going to start with the simple one. Why should we keep Donald Trump out of office? And there's a particular reason I'm asking, because there are some progressives who actually oppose Hillary Clinton so much that they're willing to oppose her even by supporting Donald Trump. Why would you go that far? And if not, why? I wouldn't go that far. I mean, look, I don't want to uh, downplay the significance of his Mm neo-fascism, right? I don't want to downplay the significance of the way in which he's unleashed uh, 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 kind of virulent uh, racism and ugliness and the nativism that follows uh, uh, from the policy he, policies he embraces, mm-hmm. right? I mean, and that is ranging from issues around immigration, uh, ranging to uh, uh, to issues around how he understands who who constitutes uh, genuine Americans, right? Uh, and more broadly, uh, and I think an economic philosophy that will will more than likely even even as he talks about. Uh, ending uh, these bad trade deals, I think at the end of the day, the attempt to sell him as a blue-collar billionaire, (laughs) right, is is Orwellian, you know, in terms of the way in which folk are using language. So I think he's dangerous. I think he's dangerous economically. I think he's dangerous politically. I think he's dangerous militarily. Um, And I think if he's elected, the most vulnerable among us, the people on the margins, the people in the shadows, will find themselves in even deeper misery. So I'm clear about that, and I'm clear about that he's a neo-fascist, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so as Cornell, Cornell my, my good friend Cornell West makes a distinction between the catastrophe of neo-fascism and the disaster of neoliberalism. Yes. Right, and I think that's a distinction that's helpful in, help, in understanding uh, why we got to keep Trump out of office, because at the end of the day, we want to keep track of the least of these. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we want to keep track of their conditions, and we don't want to create a con- a set of circumstances where uh, um, what is already a difficult set a situation becomes even worse. So later on in the interview or the debate, um, Amy Goodman asked you the question that I have a problem with, that I can't answer myself. Um, she asked you, who do you want to win? And um, you answered with a negative. You said that you don't want Donald Trump to win, um, and you couldn't quite bring yourself to to say the opposite of that cover uh, of the 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 what you would expect the other re- response to be, which is I want Hillary Clinton to win. Um, you weren't right. ready to say that. Um, I want to ask you this: it's, it's I don't know if there's an answer to it, but I have to ask it. At what point? What could Donald Trump say or do that would make a Professor Glaude say I want Hillary Clinton to win? Um. I don't think he could say anything, to be honest with you. I, I think part of what I was trying to do, at least rhetorically, is to say at any, at any cost, we need to keep Donald Trump out of office. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't amount to me supporting Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it, de facto, it leads to, I mean, people will say it's a difference that doesn't make a difference. Right. But I'm not endorsing Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. I, I just can't see myself ever doing that, given who she is. No matter how they try to rebrand her mm-hmm. as a change maker, um, I, I, I see her as the poster child, as I said, of the corporate wing of the Democratic Party. She is, in, she is um, uh, uh, committed to neoliberalism. She is a hawk. Uh, her foreign policy extends, in my view, uh, the imperial arm of the United States. So what, what I would say is that the neo-fascism of Trump is such that we need to continue to organize to keep him out of office. And as we're organizing, we have to let Hillary Clinton know that even though she will be elected by default, Mm -hmm. that it's not because we support her, it's because we resist him, and that we're organizing in such a way and we're voting in such a way to let her know uh, that this is not a vote for her or for her policies, but a vote uh, in some ways for, for a more radical 
a, a more radical vision of democracy. Now that sounds confusing and it sounds like I'm waffling, but I think at the end of the day, Brother Ben, what I'm trying to do is to figure out how do we avoid what happened in 2008? Mm. What happened in 2008, you had all of this grassroots energy organizing around uh, the Iraq war. We had hundreds of thousands of Americans getting in the streets. We had millions of people around the country or around the world organizing against the Iraq war. You had mm. folk challenging the economic policies of George W. Bush. If you look at how people were talking about George W. Bush, the rhetoric was as strong as the rhetoric is in some ways around Donald Trump. Yeah. And what happened is Barack Obama jumped in front of that energy and he became the object of the organizing. And people said, what we need to do at any cost is to keep a Republican out of office, mm -hmm. get him in there, and then we could hold him accountable. And so all the energy was directed to getting him elected, not knowing that once he got elected, there would be active efforts to demobilize, right. to demobilize that organizing energy. So instead of us throwing our organizing energy into electing Hillary Clinton, I think we need to organize in such a way, vote strategically, vote down ballot, get people to come in to turn out in massive numbers, mm -hmm. voting down ballot. If you're in the swing state or a battleground state, vote for Hillary Clinton. If you're in a red state, leave the ballot blank or vote your conscience. If you're in a decidedly blue state, do the same, mm -hmm. right? And part of what will happen is that that organizing effort to, in, order, in order to in implement this strategy will then carry over once she's in office, right? And mm -hmm. so it won't be the case that now she's in office, now we have to start organizing and mobilizing. No, we're organizing and mobilizing during the election itself. So that was a um, that was a, a strong point of contention in the debate that you had, and and the reason I'm focusing on that debate so much, uh, I originally wanted to talk to you just about your article, but when I watched the debate, I realized that it, it really was a um, kind of a microcosm of all of the conversations that are going on in progressives and and liberal and generally right. left leaning circles, which is we disagree vehemently with Hillary Clinton, but we can't allow Donald Trump to get in, but what do we, you know, how do we resolve that tension? There's a, you know, and, and quite honestly, I'm struggling with it myself because, you know, it, it's quite easy. It's, it's, it's much preferred for me to critique Hillary Clinton because I think it's a substantive conversation to be had versus looking at Donald Trump, who is r rather buffoonish. And I mean, what are we going to say about Donald Trump that he's a madman? Well, yeah, but you know, there's not really a, a substantive critique that you can give of him. Um, and so it's kind of a, a balancing act because there's these absolutes that people buy into that if I critique uh, Hillary Clinton, that means I'm supporting Donald Trump. If I critique Donald Trump, that means I'm supporting Hillary Clinton. And what you're saying is really a rejection of all of that. And you're saying that, no, we don't want Hil uh, Donald Trump. That doesn't mean we want Hillary Clinton, but we will suffer it to be so with Hillary Clinton um, so long as we're organizing properly to ensure that we can hold her accountable in a way that we were not able to hold Barack Obama accountable. Right. So, I mean, look, I mean, some of us will some of us will throw our support behind Jill Stein mm -hmm. uh, and do the work. And we understand that that is a short term and long short. It's a short term decision and has long term implications for 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 growing and, and developing the Green Party and particularly growing and developing the Green Party around issues of race and racial policy. Mm. Uh, some of us will do that work. Uh, some of us will will will, will organize. Uh, around our local local uh, issues, right? I always think about the example of what uh, that that constellation of organizers in Chicago and throughout Illinois, what they were doing uh, during the Democratic primary. They did not give much attention to who was going to be elected yeah. or selected, whether it was Bernie Sanders or or Hillary Clinton. They were focused on getting rid of that district attorney, mm -hmm. and they organized and they did it and they succeeded. The same thing happened in Cleveland. So part of what, we, what I'm trying to do, Brother Ben, is to get us to see that democratic work, that the work of democracy extends beyond election cycles. Mm -hmm. That in, when you think about voting, voting is just one thing to do in a constellation of things to do when we talk about being active in a democratic society. And so part of democratic politics involves, at least in my view, right, that grunt work, that grinding work at, at the local level that we need to be doing 
uh, in relation to, to school closings, in mm -hmm. relation to, 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 to voting procedures, in relation uh, to, to, to uh, placements of folk who are coming out of, uh, out of, out of prison, to, 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 to changing predatory policing policy. I mean, these things that impact our community directly in terms of jobs and the like, right? Mm -hmm. And so we need to be mobilizing around that and understanding that whoever's in the White House will play a role, but, but, but what we're doing at the local and, and county and state levels is just as important. So, so, part, so part of what I'm trying to suggest is that we got to change the center of gravity of, of black politics in this country. That's the first thing. And two, we have to reject what I take to be one of the more insidious dimensions of neoliberalism, and that is to, to limit our political imaginations, to make us believe that our only choice that our only choices are those choices right in front of us, mm -hmm. right? And that's what these people who are kind of coming down upon progressives who are skeptical and critical of Hillary Clinton, saying that we're electing Donald Trump, whenever they say that, they're, trying, they're conceding to the terms, I believe, uh, of, 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 of a certain kind of economic and political philosophy or rationality that leads us to believe that our only choices, our only options, of those that are right in front of us. And I think we have to be much bolder. Mm -hmm. We have to be much more radical in how we approach this thing. Otherwise, nothing changes. Right, right. Let's, let's, let's drill down a little further on, sure. um, on some of these key sure. things that you're saying. Um, mm -hmm. I, first of all, I wanna echo that sentiment of starting on the local level and building there from um, local movements, local grassroots movements, to let that be the the groundswell um, to make national change instead of top down, go from bottom up. I think that's something that we've missed uh, in in black politics and progressive politics in general uh, for for quite some time. Um, I, I want to shift over to Hillary Clinton and Michael Eric Dyson in particular. And this is a question that I wanna ask uh, Dr. Dyson, but I haven't been able to get him on my show. But it, it stood out to me like a sore thumb in this debate because he was putting so much emphasis on the need to support Hillary Clinton to defeat someone like Donald Trump. But it dawned on me that he has been supporting Hillary Clinton since before the primaries even started, before we even mm -hmm. knew that Donald Trump was going to be the behemoth that he was, this, this, this demon, as he called him, um, that Michael Eric mm -hmm. Dyson referred him to him as. So if, if he already started off, and, and you may not be able to answer it, but maybe you can just give some insight into the thinking of, of someone, of a black uh, intellectual who would support Hillary Clinton. If he already started off supporting Hillary Clinton and had already made the justifications for that support for Hillary Clinton, would it change? Would his decision and where he's, or his argument change now? Because his argument now is, I agree with you, Professor Glaude, on the problems with Hillary Clinton, but we can't pay attention to the problems with Hillary Clinton right now because of Donald Trump. What would his argument have been if it was Marco Rubio or, or Jeb Bush, someone who is pretty much innocuous or, or, or more part and parcel with Hillary Clinton? What, what are your thoughts on that, if you could speak to that at all? Well, you know, I don't want to speak for Michael, but, but what I can say is that I think the initial part of the conversation, we saw a more positive argument for, Clint, for Clinton's candidacy. Mm -hmm. and, and that argument took the shape of uh, what she has done uh, at, uh, that, you know, for, for and in and around issues of race, what she, how she's grown in terms of the way in which she's talking about race right. and what she perhaps may be capable of unlike President Obama, for whatever reasons that he has chosen to be um, uh, kind of middle of the road with regards to these issues. So he, he kind of laid that out. And then he made the shift. And if you remember the transition in the discussion, the transition came by way of an analogy, right? He says, you have to play according to the defense, yes. you know, what the That's defense right. gives you. Right. Right. What the defense gives you. And what, he, what he's saying in that moment is that what we have are the choices in front of us. And with the choices in front of us, uh, uh, we need to go with Hillary Clinton. And that, that's the transition from a kind of positive argument around her, a positive argument that I think doesn't, doesn't stand up to, to serious scrutiny, mm -hmm. to the argument that he then held to uh, for the rest of the conversation, uh, the argument that he put forward, and that is we have to keep Trump. Trump. Keeping Trump out of the White House is the priority, and by virtue of that, the default position is, is Hillary Clinton. And if you recall, 
I kept saying to him that the strategic approach to voting that I was putting forward, and that's a shift in my view. Remember, in yeah. democracy, in fact, I call for a complete blank out. Yeah. Right. Because I was thinking it was going to be a choice between Hillary Clinton and Jeb Bush. And right. to me, there's no difference that makes a difference between those two. Um, um, so I've, I've moved a right. bit given Trump's presence. And so I was saying to saying to Mike, obviously, we're in a similar place, but I'm not out here stumping for Clinton. Right. Right. right? Because I fundamentally view her as business as usual. Per- Michael, had, I, I don't want to speak for him, but it seems to be the case that he doesn't, he doesn't hold that view, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And I think an argument has to be made, uh, uh, you know, that an argument has to be made that Hillary Clinton is somehow some, uh, some, some champion of, of progressive politics. I, I, I don't find that convincing at all, yeah. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> no, I don't it, find that convincing at all. It, it, it makes complete and absolute sense, which drives me to the next question or the next problem that we face in black politics specifically, uh, progressive politics more recently, and American politics in general. It's our inability to critique those that we support. Um, And I find far too often that leaders, our intellectual leaders, um, find themselves what we call caping or defending um, even President Obama, right? In despite the fact that President Obama has a a shaky at best relationship with the black community, um, we find a lot of leaders incapable of bringing a principled critique against those that we support. Um, and I think this is an extension. The conversation that you had with Dr. Dyson is an extension of that problem that if we are supporting someone, that means that we cannot critique that someone. And that gives that uh, that politi- that politician, in my opinion, it gives them a blank check to do whatever the heck they want to do when they get into right. office. Uh, speak to that a little bit. And then how do you bring critique to someone that you admire and someone that you support? We're not talking about Hillary Clinton in this case. We're not talking about Barack Obama in this case. But let's say you your preferred candidate, are you able to maintain the balance? And if so, how do you maintain the balance of critique as well as support? Well, I think that I'm going to answer the, the, the last question first. I think what you have to keep in mind are, are the values that animate your political choices, right? So if, if what animates your political choices is a concern for justice and a love for the most vulnerable, then that's the standard. Mm-hmm. And the moment you see a candidate that you're supporting, uh, uh, in some ways, Come run up against those commitments, then that candidate has to be critiqued, mm. right? If you see a candidate embracing policies in the name of the expediency of politics or compromise that jeopardize the standing of the most, vulner- most vulnerable in, this, in, in, in your view, then you have to bring critique to bear. If you see a candidate who's making decisions that you think are unjust, right, whether it's the decision to, to bomb innocent people around the world, or whether it's the decision to, to support fracking, or mm. whether it's the decision to support trade policies like TPP mm. that give uh, uh, unimaginable powers to corporations while decimating workers here in the United States and exploiting workers around the globe, then you know at that point, right, they're embracing policies that run up against your commitments, your fundamental values, right? Mm. And that has to be the standard. And then two, it seems to me that what's more important than individuals Right. right, is a healthy and robust sense of the demos. Right, that is, you have to be committed to democracy. Right, and to be committed to democracy is to be com- is to be committed to a broad and vibrant deliberative space where everyday ordinary people can engage in the exchange of reasons, holding one another accountable as we do the work together. Right, to secure the goods that we all cherish. Right, so that we can live the lives that we what we aspire to live and to secure the future for our children. Mm. That's the goal. And so if you weren't running around here being a fan, yeah. right, as opposed to being committed to democracy, then you're going to be a fan, right? Yeah. That's, what you're gonna, that's how you're going to act. You're not yeah. going to have a critical sensibility. So, you know, so part, part, of, part of what I think we need to do, Brother Ben, is to, is to understand ourselves as radical Democrats, small d, and that the, that, that, that the real issue here isn't really about individuals or personalities, right? I always like, I say this to some folks as I've been speaking around the country, that people have gotten the, 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 the phenomenon of Bernie Sanders all backwards. Hmm. They think that Bernie Sanders, right, uh, is the cause of all of this, this grassroots energy, when in fact all of this grassroots energy is the reason for Bernie Sanders. Right. 
It is when we are mobilized, when we're organizing, when we're doing the work, we produce better choices. Mm. We produce better people who will run for office. When we're organized and mobilized, but see, this is the this is the insidious part, and I want to make sure I make sure I'm answering all the questions you put on the table. But the insidious dimension of of neoliberalism, the economic philosophy, is to eviscerate the working class. Yeah, is to is to make to make it such that working people are working so hard to keep their nose above water that they don't have time to stand in solidarity with others. So we're just busy trying to make ends meet, right? right? So so we have to challenge, right, an economic philosophy, a political reality, right, that renders us as these separate folk and imagine a politics that's much more uh, 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 rooted in the lives of everyday ordinary people together securing a future for, for themselves and for their children. Now, did I answer the other parts of the question? Yeah, yeah, no, you, you actually hit them all, and um, unfortunately, you triggered one. I was going to let you go, <laughs> but you triggered That's one. Right. Is it all right, kid? Sure. This, this one might last sure. about a five-minute, one question that might That's last okay. a little while. Um, I you because you alluded to the problem of neoliberalism, um, the effects that it has on the working class. Uh, it keeps us in a perpetual loop, uh, incapable of breaking free to actually stand in solidarity with other people. Um, and then I also re- reminded of the debate with with Michael Eric Dyson, where uh, it actually had some spillover into the fact that none of our hands are clean. Um, that right. uh, that some most of us find. It, matter of fact, I find myself on a daily basis in a space that is the quintessential example of neoliberalism. Um, so yeah. we're, we're stuck in this in this quagmire. What I want to ask um, is something that I've been thinking on for for a little while now. Um, and and it's, it has nothing to do with the debate in general, but kind of philosophically, pol- political philosoph- uh, philosophy. How much of the problem that we oppose when we oppose neoliberalism, how much of that problem is not just systemic, but inescapable and and when i say inescapable i don't mean inevitable but when people realize what it would really mean to tear down neoliberalism um or even more clear a a better example if to tear down or to end america's empire abroad and this forceful hand that we use to bring quote unquote peace or at a, at, at a minimum, we bring a stability that's familiar to America and familiar to our uh, companies to be able to uh, go and spread globalism and capitalism abroad. But if mm-hmm. we really consider the cost of ending that, would people like you and me and others who are critical of this system really be able to absorb what that really means and what that really looks like to end empire abroad, to bring an end or an adjustment to neoliberalism? It's a really big question, but I know you, you, you know, you, you can handle it. (laughs) It's a, it's a difficult question. I mean, look, there's no pure space from which to engage in this work. Right. I mean, we're all implicated in this. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, Mike talked about Cory Booker blurbing my book, my book being published by Crown um, as an indication of my own complicity. Mm. And it's important for us to understand how we are all uh, uh, shaped and, and formed and find ourselves in the circuitry of neoliberalism so that you can't be self-righteous in the critique. Right. But but that's like saying that, you know, because we're all we all sin that we shouldn't critique sin. Right. <laughs> to put it in Christian yeah. terms. Right? Yeah, I had a little Christian jump right there. I felt that one, Doc. I felt that. <laughs> right. I mean, that makes no sense. We're all sinners, so we shouldn't say anything about sin. That makes no sense to me. Mm. Right. Part of what we have to do is put forward an ideal, uh, 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 an ideal of, of, of the best set of arrangements, the best society that allows people not only to dream dreams, but to pursue those dreams, mm. to set that ideal and let it be the regulative ideal towards which we strive, understanding that we're going to fall short. For a variety of reasons. Now that said, it seems to me this. This is this is the point. There is nothing more comfortable than than the familiar. Mm-hmm. And in moments of crisis, in moments of deep fear, we often find ourselves running back to the comfort of the familiar. But if the familiar is wrought with all sorts of evils, and that's no other way to put it, brother Ben. 
Mm. If, it's, if it's characterized by all sorts of evils and we have an opportunity, an opportunity that emerges precisely because the crisis that, that has come to, to pass as a result of the contradictions mm -hmm. of capital. The contradictions of capital have made themselves manifest in such a way that it has given us an opportunity, an opening. I don't know, it's, it's, it may be fugitive, but it's an opening for us to do work. And in this moment, it requires of us the courage, the virtue of courage, to strike the blow for democratic change. But if we succumb to the vice of fear, mm -hmm. then business as usual is secure. Now that said, it requires all profit, all prophetic action is based on an imaginative leap to see the as yet in relation to the horrors of now. And that means we have to, we have to take that leap. And if we don't, then we seal our fates. Mm. Now that, that's not saying that, uh, you and I are comfortable uh, that the world that we live in for the world that our children, my child is, is, has become an adult in and is living in, that the instability that, that, that shift, that transformation will bring won't be uh, uh, unsettling, won't uh, be, uh, won't make us afraid, but we do it in the name of a better world. And what people who are committed, I'm sorry to go on so long no, here. go for it. But people who are committed to the status quo, folks who are committed to the current arrangements that exploit and abuse everyday ordinary people, they are banking their all that you and I and others are too afraid to take the leap. Mm. That, that we are too afraid to imagine okay. otherwise. And so if we don't embrace the democratic virtue of courage in a moment of possibility, then we succumb to the vice of fear. And I resist, I reject that wholeheartedly. So I think that this is perfect timing with a question that just came from our chat room uh, on YouTube. Um, what if that destruction or that reversal or uh, moderation of neoliberalism was dependent upon um, someone keep well. Actually, let me let me let me start that over again. What if achieving the goal of correcting the problems of neoliberalism was dependent upon us keeping Hillary Clinton out of office uh, and using this exact Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump 2016 scenario? Um, some in the chat room, it's come that people believe that Hillary Clinton is the greater threat because she is the quintessential neoliberal in this in this election. What if then that's a big what if, but what yeah. if keeping her out is actually part of the solution? Well, it all that 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 only holds if we don't understand the power of our organizing. Right. So if one could say if one is concerned really about if we're all concerned about uh, uh, the working poor and the most vulnerable, the most marginal, that uh, 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 Donald Trump poses a particular kind of threat to their to their circumstance, um, that he poses a particular kind of threat to the world. And we can say at the same time that we make that claim that so does Hillary Clinton insofar as she represents the status quo, that so far she represents business as usual. But if we're organizing, right, and mobilizing, then we can, we can put, you know, uh, how can James Baldwin, and I'm par paraphrasing him here, says that his vote is kind of like a stopgap measure, mm. right, just to buy me some time, mm. right, in some ways, that we can actually organize and mobilize to bring pressure to bear, to continue to bring pressure to bear. On, on, on the current state of affairs. So I'm, I'm not of the belief that if we elect her, right, it will seal our fates. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not of the belief that if we elect Donald Trump, right, it's the apocalypse. What I'm more interested in is what we're doing. Right. What we're doing in the context of this election cycle. And, and that to me means that we're cultivating a radical democratic vision among the demos, right? And we're doing that through the election cycle because it, it's, it garners all this attention at this point. Now look, let me say this really quickly, Ben. 
I'm very much aware that it's on the Democrats watch that the crime bill was passed. It's on the Democrats watch that welfare reform was passed. It's on the Democrats watch that they dismantled Glass-Steagall. It's on the Democrats. I mean, we can just go on and on and on. Right. And and I think Tom Frank has has made a compelling argument about the state of the current the current state of the Democratic Party. We know that. That's why we have to organize and mobilize. And that's why we can't buy into uh, uh, this nonsense that people are trying to sell about her as some progressive champion. Mm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. The case. Um, Dr. Uh, Professor Eddie Glaude, thank you so much for joining me. I would I would love to keep you longer, uh, but I think we have exhausted that portion of the conversation. Just promise me I can get you back again next time. Anytime, man. I love talking with you, Doc. Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, 857-600. Well, actually, before I open the phone lines, Dr. Glaude, I know everyone knows you. You are uh, extremely popular in my circles, but it is a tradition. Would you please tell everyone how to get up with you? Sure, you can contact me at, uh, at, at my email, esglaude at princeton.edu. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at esglaude, uh, and, you know, via Facebook. Just check me out. Awesome, awesome. Thanks again for joining me, Professor. Hey, man, I appreciate you. Take care. You too now.